Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to this discussion seminar uh, and on and the topic of the Imam um, in the 21st century. Uh, and I, I will be chairing, um, which gives me an opportunity to speak for a little while um, on, on a topic which is quite dear to my own research interests. Uh, and then we'll be handing over to these two guys who are going to give us a much more insider, but also academic perspective. Um, then we'll open the floor up to a discussion, um, and we want to be finished by around 8 o'clock, so let, I'll try and get this sort of, so we get a good discussion going for maybe for around about half an hour, if we can. The discussion of, certainly this discussion of imams becomes a highly contentious one, um, not only for Muslim majority communities, um, but also for Muslim majority communities too. So it's not just something that's taking place in Britain or in, or in Western Europe. Uh, and in fact, just recently, I had, I had an inquiry um, from some people who knew the work that I'd been doing over the years from Mongolia, um, saying that they also wanted to kind of, in a sense, they were also looking at this whole issue of their imams and, and the role that their imams played um, in Mongolian society. So it's something which actually is kind of interests the whole Islamic world, as well as, if you want, the non-Islamic world. But I would, I would argue that to some degree, um, the, one of the, the challenges we face um, in this particular discussion or any kind of academic work around this area um, in a Muslim minority community is that the focus of attention of, on imam training and the role of the imam um, has become one of both politicization and securitization. Um, now, my argument has always been um, that regardless of, if you want, certain events um, that, are, that are more notorious, um, the, the role of the imam in the modern world would always be an issue um, for Muslim communities and other communities. So, so it was there. Um, regardless of if you want security issues and, and, and political issues that go with it. Even so, if we go back, um, say, to, to Marshall um, writing in 2010, not talking about imams per se, but talking about Muslim faith schools, um, he said that Muslim faith schools were likely to find themselves at the forefront of government identification of schools as a tool for tackling extremist opinion and ideology. And that was stated in the 2008 Prevent Strategy. Now, although that's a, the whole issue of, of Islamic schools is a wider issue, of course the training of imams, certainly in this country and in, and in many Muslim countries, and particularly the Indian subcontinent, um, where many of the Muslims in Britain originate from, is done in Islamic faith institutions that are certainly a kind of school, um, the Darulun. The Darulun, not all students of the Darulun um, go on to become imams. Um, they also operate as normal functioning schools. But in the case of the Darulun, certainly in this country where there's probably somewhere between 30 and 40 of them in Britain, um, which is primarily concerned with the training of imams and the use of what is probably a 17th century religious curriculum formulated in India known as the Dazi Nizami, these debates have become intensely focused around one, relevance, that is the relevance of the syllabus, and also pedagogy, the style of the syllabus. So two issues there. Um, but coming to where I kind of entered the domain and other scholars entered the domain, in 2007, um, the Prime Minister, that was Tony Blair at that time, declared that imams should be trained in UK universities. Um, as too many, he said, entered Britain with poor English and an insufficient grasp of this country's traditions. You have the journalist Shepherd, I think, writing for The Guardian at the end, in 2007, responding to that, had interviewed um, Ibrahim Mogra, 
um, an imam, a young, younger generation British imam, um, trained in a British Darulum, um, and at that time um, an imam in, in Leicester, and chairman of the Interfaith Relations Committee of the Muslim Council of Britain at that time, had responded to that, that we are aware that we need UK trained imams who can speak English and know what is happening on our streets. And it was interesting because a journalist rang me um, just a couple of days ago with regard to uh, a program which Radio 4 wants to put on concerning British imams. And one of the first questions she asked me, very interesting, was how many of them are still foreign? Um, you know, and, and how many of them are, are, are British? So this issue around, if you want, imams that were culturally integrated to British society became not, not just an issue for the Muslim community, but also an issue with regard to security issues. Somehow the, the British trained imam was seen as being more integrated, uh, more culturally aware. Um, I was to point out, I like putting my foot into it, um, in, in 2008 um, that in fact the British Prime Minister's suggestions was not practical um, because British universities would not be able to provide what was a traditional um, Islamic um, authentication of the Imam, which is the, the way in which the student qualifies through what, an, what is known as Ijazah, um, and, and which is the passing on of tradition from Imam to Imam um, as a part of the quality. No, no university professor could provide that, um, and therefore you had an on pass um, with regard to that situation. The other critique um, which came around this kind of what, these challenging issues around what I would call the professionalization of the imam um, arose from Yahya Burt, who even in the earliest 2006, so even before Tony Blair's comments, had noted that the demand to professionalize the imam um, in, in Britain um, was too often modeled upon the parish priest in the Church of England, um, in which the imam embodies and this is used in his words, civic virtues, interfaith tolerance, professional managerial and pastoral skills, and works as an agent of national integration. Um, so what we find is then this huge pressure coming from government and media on traditional Muslim educators to professionalize not only the education of the imam, but the role of the imam um, in, 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 in Britain. That was going to make researchers like who were seeking collaborative partnerships, which was the stance I always took, um, even more problematic. Um, because as soon as you entered the, the domain, um, you entered this, this, this heavily politicized discourse. It made the possibility of collaboration with empathetic partners from higher education um, difficult. Um, there were access difficulties. Um, there were sensitivity difficulties. And in, in, you had to, in a sense, develop um, and the ability to walk um, within, if you want, a, a stranger's religious landscape to a very high degree um, in order to carry out your research. Um, consequently, there were access issues, um, as certainly Sophie knows back in those days, um, and, and even from, and I found um, access issues too. Around about 2008, we find a number of government agencies becoming very interested in this question, um, not least the, the, the Home Office, the DCLG, um, and, and, and a report was commissioned um, by um, Scott Bauman and McAdam um, to look into the whole issue of Islamic education and look at the possibility. I don't know what the government was expecting from that report, but, but certainly the report indicated that there were possibilities for um, uh, that not everything that was going on in the imam training or in the or in the or, 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 or was a bleak picture, and nor was everything that was going on um, in the practice of imams in Britain a bleak pic picture. Um, and it looked for collaborative partnerships openings between um, higher education institutions um, and Muslim institutions for, in a sense, the, the development of the imam in this country um, in a way that the imams themselves, the young imams themselves, would want to develop themselves in order to be better qualified to serve their communities. So it, it's not all a bleak picture, um, but it still remains a highly problematic picture and one which still 
is seen, I think, from a media perspective, um, in a sense, in a very stereotypical style, that the imams are not up to it, um, that they, at, at worst, they, they um, add to extremist discourse, and at best, um, they um, don't have the, the knowledge of the cultural terrain in which they're operating um, in order to prevent extremist discourse. And it seems to have got polarized into that kind of discourse, um, which, which then becomes difficult. It's interesting that both Bert Wright and even earlier in 2005, um, and myself in 2008, were to note that actually the criticisms were not only coming from outside, um, that there were criticisms coming from even within the circles where imams were trained. Um, so you get Bert saying, mild criticism is voiced by the younger ulama who have wanted to move into new social roles and capacities like chaplaincy, interfaith, media, youth work, and even political lobbying more quickly than the established ulama. I noted that there was actually very little opposition to professionalizing the ulama amongst the graduates, um, and there was an expressed desire for learning programs that enabled the British imam to be more effective in carrying out his profession in a contemporary, multicultural, urban British environment. It also needs to be remembered, though, that although the primary purpose of the Dar al is to create future generations of the ulama, only a small percentage of the students who exit the schools with the required qualification in religious sciences go on to become imams. So, so the issue is not necessarily about the training of the imam. The issue, whatever training the, 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 the graduate imam gets is also the training that 200 or 300 or 400 children will get. And to what degree does that training, um, is that, that education fit for purpose? Um, in a modern British society. Since that period, so if we go back to the 2007-2008 period, um, I have noted that a number of articles on, on imams, imam training, the role of the imam, um, the, the, the fit for purposeness of the imam um, in Muslim minority communities have started to appear from other European nations. Um, so for example, I. I myself have peer-reviewed um, articles that have come from France, Denmark, Germany, Spain, and Belgium. So, so the issue is becoming, if you want, even more and more an international one. Um, and, and I said, when you, when you, then you also start to get um, interest from South Africa, India, Pakistan, um, and, and Mongolia, <laughs> which might seem rather strange. But, but when, when, I go into, when I went into India and Pakistan, I was, I was surprised to find that the, that the contestation around the training of the imam um, and what changes can or cannot take place in the training of the imam and the role of the imam um, were just as intense there and sometimes even more intense there than they are here. Um, so that, that, in a sense, is kind of the background, in brief, um, to where our discussion is going to go. Um, we have two gentlemen with us who have experience of that training. That's right, isn't it, both of you? So um, can comment um, from, from their own perspective. Um, Salim um, studied the traditional Islamic sciences for seven years um, and then went on to, um, to be awarded a scholarship to study a diploma in contextual Islamic studies and leadership at Cambridge Muslim College. During his, there, his year there, he studied 18 different academic and practical course modules, including world history, Western intellectual history, and world religions. He's delivered Friday sermons um, and circles frequently and continues to be invited as the Muslim representative for engagements at the Cambridge Interfaith team. So both sides of the story, a uh, uh, Western education and an Islamic education. Um, Haroon also completed his Dazi Nizami studies and then completed the degree in economics and social studies at the University of Manchester before taking up employment um, at Ernst & Young. What is Ernst & Young? Chartered Accountants? Yes. Yes, <laughs> okay. Um, PGCE in maths, so modern pedagogy um, is there, um, but also lectures um, at a Dar al So, So they're able to speak really 
um, from from both sides of the of of, of the picture of, and and give us an, an insider's account um, of the the Darul um, the, the role of the Imam, um, and the role of the Imam in in, in minority societies. So we're over to you, too. <laughs> I think. Um Professor Ron has talked about mostly of what I wanted to talk about, so I'm going to keep it very brief because I want to take on some questions. And I think it's an opportunity for, for you to an ask more questions. Um, the Dar al -Ulums, I mean, we, we've been working in Blackburn Dar al uh, which we believe is um, a Dar al that really wants to get to grip with the challenges that Muslims are facing, and not just Muslims, if I'm honest with you, with British society in general. So the leadership team, the people that are involved in Dalum, really see the vision, given the demands that are being placed upon Imams from within the Muslim community, in terms of pastoral care, um, education, and all these other demands that are being placed upon Imams, uh, whilst there's also demands externally from outside the Muslim community, which Professor Ron has alluded to it. So they're under extreme kind of pressure. But the students, unfortunately, living in the real world, uh, don't have any kind of appreciation of that, at least from our experience. So when I, when I was there for six, seven years, it was glorious six, seven years, you know, in a secure four walls. Um, but when you come out there, there's a huge challenge that um, the students need to be really getting to grips with. And so we realized that. Uh, we really need to get involved and this is some of the work that we're doing based on our experiences traveling around Britain and mixing with the rest of society. So we think the work that we're doing, uh, and, and I'm going to try and keep this short as I can, is absolutely groundbreaking. Uh, we think it's essential. Uh, we think that the change ha can only come from within the institute for some of the reasons that has been already been mentioned. Uh, and um, the change can have a huge impact, not just for Muslims, Muslim leaderships, um, but also for British society in general. I mean, if, just to give an example, I mean, if we have imams who are trained in traditional sciences, who know um, the traditional heritage and the canon of heritage and tradition that we have, but at the same time understand modern philosophy and, and, and so forth, also, and also understand the challenges that Muslims and non Muslims are facing and kind of um, deal with some of the common concerns. So, just something like the NHS, as an example, you know getting involved with the NHS, being, getting Muslims involved with the NHS, in education and so forth as well. We think in the long term this is going to be a huge uh, move and step in the right direction because the fact of the matter is 80% of the Imams, 80% of the, the, the Imams that we have are from the Obandi Dialooms. That's a huge percentage, you know, by any measure. And so if we can do that, and so what we're trying to do here is we realize that um, Dialooms have a place in society and Dalum that we're working for also realizes that we need to work with universities um, to help us uh, achieve what we want to achieve. But there's also an interest for them uh, because they're able to kind of reach out to a larger community and serve society, which is what we think we need to do. And um, so we're trying to, in our own ways, develop a collaborative partnership with universities while respecting our own traditions that we have. And that's a rich tradition that um, the Darlums have and the universities have, uh, but also working together for, um, to kind of create courses, to create leaders uh, who are able to steer uh, British society, I wouldn't even say Muslim society, I would say British society, because it's all about all of us who are able to steer Muslim British society in, in the right direction and give strength to um, society, which we have, we already have done to take that forward and to give greater guidance to our ever burgeoning youth population as well. So that's where we're doing and we're really, we're genuinely passionate about it. I mean, we've been working on it for about four years now, three years. Uh, most of it has been kind of our, on our own backs. Uh, and we've seen, we've already started to see the early kind of uh, movements that are taking place in, in this work. And we hope this will take us even further. So that's what I just wanted to share with you there briefly. Um, if, I, if I may say, I'm not going to take more time because I think it's important for everyone to have an opportunity to ask questions and I think discussion will be more fruitful. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll be very brief. Um, what I would like to add is um, the course that we deliver, um, what we've done over the past few years is develop, um, developed a relationship um, through uh, organisation um, known as Association of Muslim Schools who um, work with um, the Middlesex University to provide accreditation for a course which is additional to the Darsan Nizami which Professor Ron um, touched upon earlier. 
Um, so you, you've got the Dars in Islami course of six years, um, so which the traditional Islamic sciences are taught, so Arabic and um, the, the, the Quran, the Hadith, the prophetic traditions, the jurisprudence, the fiqh, um, and some of the other sciences, the traditional Islamic sciences. So you've got that on one hand, but also you can, um, students can elect and choose to study additional modules which are accredited by Middlesex University um, and include um, Islamic history, Islamic education, Sharia and its application to family life, um, um, the study of Quran and Hadith, um, particularly focusing on Orientalism um, and um, looking at the tradition of mysticism or tasawwuf. Um, within Islam. So there's a number of modules um, that are accredited by a mainstream university which can also be taken by students whilst they're there in the university. So that's, that's the way we're trying to find a way of complementing the traditional Islamic side with a mainstream um, Western academic education. So students potentially can come out with credits for the first two years of a degree program at the end of it if they choose to take this opportunity. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish on that note and open up for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you both for that. Um, I wondered if I could kick off um, uh, for kind of open up to the floor. One of, one of the challenges I found when I started to engage in kind of conversations with with some of the, certainly some of the older um, senior ulama in the Diabandi tradition um, was a very strong sense that the Dazi Nizami curriculum was, was a sacred terrain. Um, it, it wasn't just an issue of, of, of secular kind of education which you can kind of update or you know bring in the latest theories from education or whatever um, it, it it had become I would say over the period of time that it certainly existed in the Diabandi tradition it's become highly sacralized and, and I wonder to what degree that that becomes a difficulty for you in any kind of attempts that you make uh, in, a, in a way to negotiate changes in the curriculum or reform of the curriculum. That's um, um, in terms of um, the Dersi Nizami, um, there is a tendency to preserve um, the Dersi Nizami. That by all means exists and it, it would be difficult to deny that. Having said that, if we look at the history of the Dersi Nizami, it has changed and therefore if we look at even different institutions within the country, the Dersi Nizami looks different in every institution. That suggests in and of itself that there is some degree of change that does take place. And if we take the example of Black Bandar Ulum, even over the past few years, um, uh, we, we have um, one particular individual within the Dar Ulum besides ourselves who is um, looking at improving the Dersi Nizami. So, so the, the change does take place, um, however, there's a um, the, the importance is attached upon shura or upon consultation in order that the change that takes place um, takes place for the better and for the long term good. So I think the debate and discussion is important for that change to take place to ensure that whatever change comes um, is going to be for the better. I, I just I just kind of on our experience in Darulum as well, I mean, there are changes taking place very visibly, at least from our perspective. So just to give an example, we've had a graduate who's a friend of ours who's kind of revamped certain aspects, certain subjects, modules, and actually uh, translated them or changed them from Urdu, which is language that's commonly been used in Darulum, to English. Um, so students are able to kind of grasp um, the kind of text a bit more easier and kind of be able to relate that. So there are changes taking place. Um, a lot of the examination procedure has been passed over to the younger students uh, who kind of take responsibility, who actually write the exam paper now. So it's done independently from the teachers, whereas traditionally the teachers would set the exam. Uh, but now in, in, in our case anyway, the younger students are actually given a responsibility for setting the questions themselves, totally independent from the teacher. So there are these changes taking place at different levels um, and it will take time. Um, and there are certain texts that probably won't be changing much, but some other texts will 
will have room for maneuver and that will take time. That's just the nature of Darul Ulooms, I think. I've got a number of questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if I start backwards, uh, when does something, I mean, I looked at your syllabus on Blackburn and, and there's quite a lot of changes, especially in the, in the first few years. Yeah. When does something actually stop being Darul Ulooms? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very good question. <laughs> because uh, if you were to send your syllabus to India, they won't recognize it. Excellent. So is the whole idea of Darsal Nizami it's just a romantic concept of affiliation? If I may, I think um, Molina Harun's alluded to it earlier. Um, I think there's certain texts which cannot be changed. So for example, I can't see the, the, the last year of Hadith that changing. Or for example, the teaching of the translation of the Quran that changing. Or the tafsir of Jalalain not being within the cu curriculum, even Hidayah probably uh, may not change. So I think there's certain texts, or the Hanafi fiqh in general, Hanafi texts in general, um, I think that pretty much is going to be a constant, seems to be a constant. Um, other texts, um, I think there's room for chopping and changing. I actually think, I actually believe that the fact that we have, even in England, we have different variants of the Dars in Islam is actually a good thing because it shows that it's actually proof in of itself that it is open to change. Because if we just had one type of dress in Islam which everyone runs, then that would just shows that it's quite rigid. But the fact that even in Leicester or other places you go, you'd find there's different variants and they're continually being adapted from within the tradition as well. So I, I alluded to the one in Blackburn as an example of a student himself being given responsibility. So I think there is the desire to kind of adapt and change the dress in Islam. But the question about what, what does what stops being addressed in Islam is quite an interesting mm. question. But the, again, this adaptation, I mean, what is it based on? Is it based on surveying what the Muslim needs are? Or is it just, I don't know, simplifying those classical texts? I mean, is there any research? Uh, does any research go into how you adapt or how you change the Dars in Islam? Mm. Sure. Okay. Um, I, in terms of, I, I don't have any research as such, but no, anecdotally... People who make the adaptations, yes. do they go and survey and research what needs changing or, or how, how is that done? How, is one, how does one decide that it needs to be changed? That's, that's an important question. How, how does the need for change um, be felt by, by the organisation? I, I think it's about looking at looking at the dars and taking feedback from the students and the teachers and seeing what kinds of difficulties um, people are facing with the text. Like, uh, as we know, having studied in the institution, certain texts are, can be quite difficult to study and quite dense. So, and if that's the first text that students are taught, then it can make it very difficult for them to understand. So part of it is the heal is about um, um, providing texts which are make, make simplify what you're referring to. So a lot of that work, especially which one of our colleagues is doing in the Darul Ulum, is around simplification or making it more easier for the students to understand the subject at hand. The work we do in to complement that is around the context. How can we expose the students to the context so that when they go out there in the world, it makes it easier for them to relate to everyday issues and everyday people. Okay. Can I just put my final question forward? It's to you, Ron. Um, where, would you, uh, where would you situate the Siddiqui report in, in all this thing that you mentioned when you were contextualizing the whole politicization and secretization? The, the Siddiqui report around the study of Islam in UK universities? Yeah. Well, the, the Siddiqui report wasn't as such around the issue of, of imams and imam training. Um, I think the Siddiqui report raised a number of issues around um, what, in a sense, was being taught um, and represented in, in, a, in a British context. I mean, I think the main thing there was, in a sense, that certainly when Tony Blair left or, or bequeathed a certain amount of public money, um, I forgot what the sum was now, uh, to, to further the development of Islamic studies. Um, 
the first question that actually arose out of that was exactly what was Islamic studies because there was nothing in this country that was called per se Islamic studies there was Middle Eastern studies there was South Asian regional studies there was theology and religious studies departments but there was nothing per se that was called Islamic studies in Britain um, which raised so, so it then raised a whole question around who got the money <laughs> if it was for Islamic studies where should it go um, and, and there was a number of us who also raised the issue of Muslim studies, um, which we thought was a significant voice in, 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 in the whole thing, but which wasn't really being... So, so it, it kind of, I think the question then was the, what actually was the terrain that we were talking about and who represented that terrain. Um, and so I, I think that's where the Siddiqui report was more, and, and it raised some very, very sort of interesting debates. With, I was there for those debates around, if you want, the borders of studying Islam, Muslims, uh, in, in a British context, um, and the focus of that. Um, I think it feeds in, in, in a sense, of what is the role of um, a traditional Western university uh, in, in its teaching of Islam, because traditionally, in a sense, in a, in, in a kind of a, what you might call an Orientalist paradigm, um, with, with a kind of a, a hermeneutical focus, the I don't think those kind of scholars would ever have considered um, that the issue of engaging um, in with Muslims. Uh, and, but, but I think for those of us who, in a sense, have studied communities over the last 20 or 25 years, um, I've, I've come from a very different tack in which we kind of came to, some of us certainly came to a realisation that you couldn't study people um, and stay distant and outside of it. Um, and therefore there had to be some kind of engagement with those communities. Uh, and in that context one could then consider the issue as a part of that, that could one of the ways in which you engaged with the communities that you studied might be partnerships with traditional Muslim educators. So you got, and I, and I think that shouldn't just be one way. I, I, I'm a firm believer that in that we can learn from each other. I think there are, there are some things which traditional Muslim educators can teach university educators, and there are some things which university educators can teach traditional Muslim educators. I, I, I don't believe this is a one way kind of hyper, don't, we've got to pump the good stuff into these Muslims who don't know how to do it. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, um, we've got to be very wary of those dis that kind of a discourse. Thank you. <laughs> can I just ask here then, you, one of the things, I got that hand there, one of the things that you said was Hanafi fit, and you said yes. you didn't see that being something which was changed. Yeah. And one of the things that I've kind of felt I know at this point in time the Darulums that we have in Britain, because they come out predominantly the Deobandi tradition and some Burelvi institutions, are of South Asian origin and therefore Hanafi Fiqh was always the predominant. But we're not just a multicultural Britain, we're a multicultural Muslim Britain too. Um, and increasingly so, with, Muslim, with more and more Muslim communities that are not Hanafi. Um, and, and I wondered whether you kind of feel that perhaps that Hanafi fiqh is negotiable in order to reach out to, <laughs> you know, to a wider Muslim population than just the South Asian one. I, I think I should qualify what I've just said earlier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, as in the Hanafi fiqh being at the core of the dars, that's not to suggest that uh, other schools of thought cannot be taught alongside it. Um, so for example, in our Dar ulum, our colleague, he's, um, he's got he's developing um, some kind of curriculum um, or uh, at least incorporating some texts from other schools of thought within the curriculum to support, uh, to, to be studied alongside the Hanafi fiqh. So once one has got a grounding in the Hanafi fiqh, then um, the, the student potentially can be exposed to other schools of thought. So that kind of work has started to happen within the Dar ulum. But what I was referring to earlier really is the Hanafi fiqh being at the core because of predominantly um, British Muslims being associated with the Hanafi school of thought yeah. but, um, and originating from the Indian subcontinent. Therefore, I, don't, I can't see that changing as in being at the core. Nonetheless, other schools of thought can be taught, but probably not to the same degree. 
Heraclitus, so Heraclitus adds something to that, if that's so that it is. Um, what we, we sometimes see in this trend, what sometimes happens is that because there's, there's so much focus on the Hanifi fit, when the student graduates from these uh, Darul Ulum, and they go into the wider world, and they've been learning issues related to, you know, how many buckets of water you need to take out when a, when a uh, rat falls in the well, and, and going into kind of really pedantic, you know, yeah. um, so what about the rope, what about the nature of the rope, is it made, if, it, if it's made out of nylon, if it's made out of this, then what do you do, so really, really pedantic stuff. And one of the things that we feel is that when a student goes out and suddenly goes into an Arab mosque and there's uh, people from different school of thought or Salafi and they ask sometimes simple questions, they can't answer it because they've never come across it or they've not, they've not studied it in depth. So sometimes there is this kind of a dissonance that they're, they're highly sophisticated in, in one school of thought, yeah. but in, in the other, you know, they, they can't answer it. Or a young British Muslim who's quite used to turning on his water from the tap in the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Which comes back to the issue of relevance, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so. Well, I mean, um, sorry, I can book from thank you for being here. Um, it kind of goes on from the question um, you picked up on wrong, which was about the kind of South Asian Hanifi sort of uh, dimension to the Darul Ulum. I wonder, to what extent are there starting to be students from a non-South Asian background? So, um, if at all, uh, and is there any effort as well to consciously think, well, are there British Muslims who are South Asian in background who might be interested in the Darul Ulum in the education kind of we offer, and, and are there any moves to kind of accommodate this? Um, I, I definitely think DALMS do take on, I mean the ones we're involved with do take on students from outside the South Asian um, background if you like. Um, uh, in terms of accommodating for people who are British Muslims, I don't, I actually, I mean this is open to debate but I actually think it's up to the younger generation who are coming through to kind of think about this more than the Dalums at the moment, so like people like ourselves who are coming through, we're already thinking about that. We're thinking about well, how can we create an institute which takes in people from a broader range of backgrounds, so uh, men, women, people from different backgrounds, people who just want to study Islam kind of after work and things like that. So we're already doing that. So I think it's not going to come from the Dalum immediately, but I don't see any reason why it'll come from a kind of graduates from Dalums, kind of like a se separate institute because that allows kind of Dalums to focus on what they're doing best and the other people do, you know, like Adam Smith, you like in economics, do what, you do what you're really good at. And so let the Dalums do what they're doing and then people who are graduate, younger, who have kind of more kind of energy and enthusiasm perhaps can kind of tailor for a different market, if you like. That's, what, that's the way I see it working. I mean, as it stands, how central is all of the two, the um, syllabus and how much is the, that is changing or is going to change? Hmm. Urdu is a difficult one um, because um, on one hand uh, that's the Dermani Dari Ulums um, from the outset have had Urdu from the start so it's something that's seen central to the um, to the curriculum in some ways so the, the language of delivery will um, has been Urdu having said that the Urdu, I think, may still be there in order to preserve the tradition in the future, but a lot of the delivery is starting to take place in English. Um, so some of the younger teachers within the Dar Ulum have started to talk English. And if you look at, for example, South Africa, mm -hmm. there's a greater focus on the English. Yeah. So in principle, from there, we can see that to teach the Dars in English is a possibility, but because of the way the British um, the Ubundi tradition has developed, I don't see that changing anytime soon. And I don't know whether the complete change would be a good thing either. Um, that would be up for debate and discussion. But yeah, there, there does definitely need to be more emphasis on the English. That I think we can agree on. And I think that's where we're trying to come in because we, we understand that, I mean, the Urdu text in the Ubundi tradition are vast. Right. And if you were to vi bypass that, you're, you're, you're bypassing a huge treasure trove of intellectual heritage. So you can't just bypass that. So, so what I would say is if we can work on the English side, what will then happen is we'll create a generation of scholars. This is my personal vision in one way, is to create a generation of scholars who are able to translate or um, actually take on this language and translate it into English 
in a way that's rich and does um, serve some justice to the tradition as well. So we're still at that stage where we're trying, and this is part of what we're doing with, with the collaboration, is we're trying to create generation scholars who are able to look at the tradition, the heritage of the Urdu text that we have, and translate that into an English um, in a way that you know, it's able to reach a wider audience. I mean, many Arab scholars I've read have praised the Diobandi tradition. You know, many, many Arab scholars have said, you know, if, if only this was in Arabic, or if only this was in another language, you know, this is, how can you just keep this in Urdu? You know, how, why don't you share it? So there is, there is that importance of Urdu still in within the Urban Dialogues. Thank you for coming. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the motivations that are driving um, the, the new generation of Imams? And you mean in terms of people wanting to go to a dialogue or to become an Imam? Um, both, not just people who are becoming Imams, but people who are studying as well in the dark. Okay, that's an interesting question. That's something I want to find out myself, to be honest. Um, but if I leave the Imam one for one side and just answer the one that motivates, I think there is a strong current, um, not just within Darul, just broadly speaking, people want to kind of learn Islamic knowledge, especially within <coughs> the younger population, even with the professional population. I mean, I run study circles myself uh, at home or in my little kind of shed, if you like. Uh, and so there is a demand. I think that the reason is people want to connect to tradition, and that's one of them. Um, they are kind of, um, they want to move away from, kind of, they're facing challenges from the West, which they perceive as threatening perhaps, and they want some sort of um, direction. Um, they're also for themselves, so they're, they're, they're growing, they're, their children are growing. And this is a conversation I've had with many young parents like me uh, who think about, well, what about my child? You know, what's going to happen? It's, it's challenging. So they want to learn about Islam themselves because they realize that when I was younger, I didn't learn as much, so I can do this part time in the Islamic course. So that's probably another motivation for people who want to go to alums. There is obviously some students who go into the in Islamic course because their parents want to kind of put them there because it's a good place to be rather than, you know, be out there in the world and doing it X, Y, and Z. So there is still that. But I think personally we're moving away from that. In fact, Blackman Dalum, um, and I can't speak for other Dalums, actually has a process now. So you have to apply, you're interviewed away from your parents and they try and get behind the motivations, and this is something I'm going to look into in terms of what kind of responses the students give. So we have a vetting process, if you like, where students come in, they have to do a series of exams, um, even in, um, in maths and so forth, and then we kind of find out, well, why is it that you want to study Islam? And I think another thing which is quite a trend at the moment, and I've seen this, is you've got YouTube, you've got the internet, and people are seeing scholars on there with these five-minute videos that are inspiring and motivation, and then people want to become scholars. You know, it's, 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 we, might, we might laugh at it, but it's a reality. You know, and you only have to speak to a lot of youngsters who learn their deen, they learn their faith from the YouTube, and they're like, oh, I want to become a scholar now as well. So there's, there's lots of motivations. Thank you. Did you want to add to that? I think um, yeah. that's a sufficient, okay. brilliant answer. Uh, I, I, I would just very quickly add that, that certainly I found when I interviewed um, you want those that were in the final year, um, and this certainly was Blackburn Dowlet, so we're, we're in the same institution, um, and, and, and allowing for the fact that probably students have been selected to talk to me, so <laughs> they were looking for good ones to talk to me. But um, I mean, certainly I found a very high level of motivation, not just to, to serve Islam, but to serve humanity. Um, that seemed to be a very, very dominant theme that came out, you know. So, so young men that were talking about becoming eye surgeons, or, or you know, and, and wanting to go and, in, into hospitals in in the Middle East or Africa, um, and provide a, a very modern training in in, in difficult, you know, um, poverty-stricken situations, uh, and so. Uh, but like any school, um, mo most schools. Children are selected by their parents. They go to the school, not, not by their own decision. So, uh, and that's also true in the Dharma. Uh. I, I was just wondering whether these kind of transformative ways of learning and teaching um, have kind of been resisted by existing imams or those in the Muslim community. I've seen some of the work that we are doing in. Um, yeah. I think resisted is that we haven't had, because we're working within an institution which 
um, trains imams in effect um, and the, the, the institution itself, the management of the institution itself is very supportive of the work we do. We haven't really experienced much resistance, no, have we've we? Probably, we've probably experienced the opposite. Probably we've, 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 we've actually had demand um, for people who want to do the course, to join the course of people who have graduated and people from within the Muslim community who have heard about the course. And actually, I'm not trying to send the course, but um, of course. But um, we've had people that actually, parents have come to me and said, why don't you do this in our school? But the fact of the matter is, there's just two of us at the moment, or three of us at the moment. So we haven't had resistance. What I will just add, which is I think is really, really important, is often overlooked, is it's all about your relationship that you have within the Dalaloom. So the amount of work you can, you can get to, in done in a Dalum is how you are seen or perceived by the people who run the Dalum. So if you're seen as one of them and seen from within the tradition, you're given a lot more liberty and freedom. And that's something for us that's been a great asset because we're, we're able to do a lot of things in a Dalum and we've been given more control than we otherwise would have done in Dalum. So yeah, I know I'm kind of di deviating from your question, but I want to make this important point, which is really important that like any institution, you know, if someone came to your door and you don't quite know them, you know, how much are you going to give to them? But if you know this person, you've had that relationship, you've, you've seen their track record, then you're more likely to give them more. And that's just a natural human kind of trait or behavior. That's very important that we bear that in mind. W would it be true in that context then to say that <coughs> Muslim parents themselves who choose to send their children to a Darulum, to some degree are driving change? Yes. Yeah. Uh, because they because they want the secure environment, mm -hmm. they want their children to be good Muslims, but they also want them to be successful. Of course, and and and, and one of the motivations for Black One Dalum is, I mean, even though it's a Dalum which trains trains imams and future ulama, I mean, if you look at the uh, school education, it's outstanding, uh, and so there is that side which, and, and you have to remember, they don't have a two million pound budget, <laughs> you know, they they have a shoestring budget. Anyone that looks at a finance of a Dalum the fees that they charge, and they're doing a tremendous job. I mean, you get, I mean, it's one of the top schools in Blackburn, right, which, and school isn't their focus, really. So there is that demand that, okay, we're going to send our children here, but we also want them to get great GCSEs and A-levels as well. So there is that drive. Can I just come, Sophie, come in on this, this point, yeah. though, because, I mean, you, you've, you've touched on the nub of the question that is the focus for this conversation about the relationship between Darwin and and higher education and if Muslim parents are choosing to send um, their children to the Durham because it's a secure Islamic environment and they'll be safe, are they really ready to commit to the idea of their children learning about Islam in a university setting where there won't be the same protection? And parents ultimately are the people who are paying the fees and so is there likely to be a kind of roadblock at that point where parents are saying, well actually we're not very comfortable about our children learning about Islam in a university setting where they are exposed to all the kind of vices that go with the university uh, environment um, and where there is there's still this legacy of kind of quite orientalist approaches and the bottom line is the parents pay the fees that will make this possible or not in the future and so I just wonder whether you feel you know I mean do you have your finger on the pulse as to actually how the, the parents feel about the prospect of a closer relationship between Darulu and the university setting? If, if we take if we go by what our experiences um, and um, where we are at the moment, in order to get on to this additional course um, that we have, Islamic Studies course, which is accredited by Middlesex University, the first two years of the, of the degree programme, um, that is a voluntary programme and um, the parents have to give a certain amount of money in order for their children to be on the course. Um, and of course not all parents are up for the course and we have to accept that but that's not to suggest that none of the parents are up for the course either. So some parents will be wanting their children to have that education within the Daru Ulum and others may not be and I think we just have to be open to that diversity. 
I suppose just kind of following on then, the, 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 because it's delivered within the Dara Loom, they can feel assured about the kind of safety <laughs> <laughs> from a spiritual point of view of, of their child who's studying that programme. But um, a collaborative partnership that really was genuinely two-way and mm. involved the campus of two institutions is a different matter. Mm. And yet, if actually some of the kind of leadership needs, the pastoral needs of Muslim communities in the future are going to be addressed, <coughs> then it requires a leadership who have been exposed to some of the vices of the modern world and who understand how to retain their own spirituality and their own religious uh, conviction within that complex secular world. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I, I it's a comment rather than a question, really. Yeah. It's a, just a, a thought that actually this I, is... What, what I'm going to quickly, very quickly say, and this is probably one of, this is one of my reasons getting involved, what I'm involved in currently, and I hope it'll take me further, is that I think we have a bottleneck. Um, ideally, what we'd really like is we'd like our students to go to universities and benefit from dialogue rooms and universities. But I think the parents generally would like, wouldn't have an issue with that as long as the teachers or the kind of people managing the whole relationship or people from within the system. And the problem then we have is we don't have enough of those people at the moment yet. I say yet because I'm optimistic and I'm hoping that that will change very quickly and I'll work really hard to change that, hopefully. But so if we can do that within the next five to ten years where we create through what we're doing, um, a group of students, maybe even four or five, who are going through academia, who understand the challenges and they are able to kind of create this relationship where students can go in the evening, on the weekend to university, whatever, however it's going to work. Um, and the parents will feel a lot more secure because it's a Maulana that they know, or it's a person that they know, because in our communities it's all about the person, um, unfortunately, more than what's been taught. So, so if the person there is seen as someone as, and I talked about relationships before, and this is again very, very important, this is an underlying theme, that if it's someone that you know from within the community, he's your local imam or he's your local um, person in Blackburn, and then they will be like, okay, I have no issues with this cause because I know this person, I know what he's achieved, and I want my son to become like him, so therefore I'm going to allow my son or my daughter to go down that route, and I think that's really important. So in many ways, we're trailblazers, if you like, in what we're doing. We're setting, we're setting a trajectory, hopefully, for future of this. I think, I think Sophie, there's probably that, that those that would go on from a Darulum to study in an Islam, Islam in a British university as, as, as a degree are probably, we're still only talking about a very small percentage of Darulum graduates who would do that. Many will go on to university, far more, and do subjects which are not Islam, you know what I mean, uh, and, and will therefore still have to engage with everything that goes on in, in British secular institutions. Um, so parents, in a sense, are then torn, aren't they, between one, the desire for their children to, to be successful and university being a road to success, and two, to, in a sense, protecting them. You can't fully protect all, all of someone's life. Uh, and it's, it, I think it's true. That I, I once allowed an open conversation to take place amongst a group of, of um, newly qualified um, imams who had done Islamic studies. Um, Manchester and Exeter, um, I think Leeds. And that was quite an interesting conversation because that, that was torn between those who were saying, man, that is really challenging to your faith. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> and, and others who were saying, yeah, but that's a good thing because if your faith isn't challenged, what kind of faith is it? Which is, which is actually a very similar, actually, kind of conversation that I've heard take place amongst Christian students coming to study theology <laughs> in a British university as well. You know, that, that, that faith needs to be challenged. It can't just be protected, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, for faith to grow, you need to take on those kind of challenges and deal with them intellectually as well as emotionally. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, it was very interesting to see that that conversation was taking place amongst them. Parents are another issue, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's five past eight. We should probably call it to a halt there.
Um, so thank you so much for some very some good questions coming out to provoke the discussion and thank you you two for for coming along and, and giving us that experience of what is taking place mm -hmm. in the Blackburn Darling, which to some degree is representative of the kind of challenges that are being faced in all of the Darlings. Mm -hmm.